So before we begin, I want to talk about some the most serious part of this. And it's about the name of this thing is called rape of the law. Rape is nothing to joke about. It's absolutely nothing to joke about. I mean, it's one of the worst things we've got. It's up there with murder and arson and all the rest. You know, you're a rapist. And you, you're a loathsome human being. So you got to be real careful about this thing. It's a big deal. It really is. Rape's nothing to be, to nothing to joke about. But <laughs> during the time period that this was written, the word rape was not exactly the same. In fact, the word for what we call rape today was ravish. Ravish. He ravished me. Remember at the end of Dunn's poem, uh, his holy, one of his holy sonnets, he says, but that you ravish me. So G, he's asking Jesus to rape him. Wow. But anyway, um, in this case, in this time period, rape was, the word rape was more akin, not completely. It was the, the connotation of it was still forced sex. But the denotation of it was theft, Kidnapping, abduction, it's taking something by force. So it's not exactly, what we're talking about here today is rape of the lock. And what is it, what is a lock but a lock of hair? This story is about a baron, a man, who comes up behind a beautiful young woman and cuts off a lock of her hair. They call it rape of the lock. And I like to start with that because... There's, you know, the word rape is no joke, not at all. But we are going to joke about this instance, okay? Now let's take it to the next level. There's nothing to joke about. I mean, today, like, if you were to go up to someone and cut off a huge portion of their hair, now, assuming you didn't touch them in any other way, there's no physical marks in any way except the, cut, the cutting of the hair, Today, that might still be considered assault. I don't know. I'm not a lawyer. I don't know. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. And domestic violence is horrible. And I just have no love for you know, anybody who does that. This is Alexander Pope. And he's not the Pope, but Alexander Pope. He's a guy named Alexander Pope. He's about that tall. I'm 6'5". Ish. I'm 5'7", come on. I am 5'7". Um, so, but this dude, he was about four, I think it says it somewhere, four or something. Anyway, he got TB of the bones, which is different when he was young, and he never grew much. Um, he was a Catholic. And remember about Catholics, even during the reign of Anne, we're talking about after the glorious, the golden revolution when... Um, Peter II, his daughter and her husband came back and took control, and they were Catholics. Even during that time, Catholics in England could not hold office. They couldn't be in the court. They couldn't, you know, they were pretty much excluded from all aristocracy, all, all highfalutin society like that. Um, so Alexander Pope was a Catholic, and he, that, he couldn't go to the university. He wasn't accepted because he's Catholic. Can you imagine that? England. Anyway, so, so, uh, he, he taught, he was largely self taught. He taught himself Latin and Greek, and he gave himself a, a, what's called a liberal education, a classical education, studied all the great myths, all the, all the Ro Greco Roman myths. Um, and eventually he was able to translate the Iliad and the Odyssey from Greek, from the original Greek into uh, modern English. And from that, he was able to live a pretty comfortable, you know, modest, but pretty comfortable living. And he was one of the only people that actually made their money from, except Dryden, of course, but uh, made their money from actually writing, you know, during this time period. So what's he doing? All right, there were two, there was a woman. There was, this really happened in real life. 
there was a woman at court and her name was Arabella Firmer. And she is the model for Belinda. Belinda is the hero of this. Okay, so she was the actual lock of hair as a joke. And it created lifelong enmities between these two families. And in the, in the bane of Romeo and Juliet, they turned on each other. And it was a feud like none other. And it really kind of tore, you know, when the, when the court is not happy, then the king, queen is not happy. And nobody's happy. And then the whole thing. So, so what, what he's trying to do, Pope, he, he's not a courtier. He's not a member of the court, but he knows people. He has friends who, you know, it's just like maybe one degree of separation. And uh, so he writes this to try to, to try to make them see the silliness of their feud. Yes, it's a horrible thing what he did, but it's not worth, it is not rape. It's not rape. And it is not worth tearing both yourselves, your families, and the whole country apart over. So what does he do? He writes a mock epic. A mock epic. Not an epic, a mock epic. So he uses heroic couplets. He evokes the muse. He uses all of those literary tropes to to uh, create this epic, the highfalutin language, $10 words, the polysyllabic words, all of that he uses. Now, I taught you Milton, and, I, and I, 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 I'm, you know, Milton is the highest of the high. He is the, probably the most snobby of all the snobby literature that there is in this world, Milton, Milton Paradise Lost. It's the top. You, you read it, you heard, heard me read it, read it at least. I mean, every line is full of illusions and Greek and this and all the, the, the lofty language. And he's making fun of it. He lived at the same time and he's making fun of it. He's saying, yeah, you know. And so he is writing a satire. And in the satire, he's trying to get the people at court to, to laugh at themselves. And by laughing at themselves, they're like, oh, yeah, I guess we are being kind of stupid, aren't we? You know, it's just like apologize and we'll be good. Hair grows back. Yeah. Going through my notes here, he evokes the muse. He, there's this emphasis on rage, just like the, um, just like epics. When in epics, Beowulf, that first word just, I just, I just, I doubled over laughing because it starts with so it's just it's just so over the top you know like so and you just listen to the to the wording in in uh, beowulf uh paradise lost the iliad the odyssey gilgamesh i mean any of the great epics and it's just when we went out and battled and there was it was i was underwater for 12 days and killing the monster and i slept and you just, at some point, you're just like, come on, you know? Well, he takes it to that same level with this over what he is trying to say. And I'm trying to be in gent I'm being gentle because I don't like that, you know? But um, what he is saying is a trivial matter. You guys, you're, you're elevating this trivial matter to, the, to like the war of nations almost, you know? <clears throat> he evokes the muse. In all epics, there is the battle scene. In Beowulf, we have at least four, right? But in, in, in preparation for the battle scene, there is the donning of the armor, you know? <clears throat> the taking of the ancestral sword. The spear here, son, take this spear and avenge the family. Well, in this, <laughs> in this epic, the armor are the women putting on their makeup in the bathroom, he calls the toilet, you know, put it on their makeup. And I don't know if they did that thing or whatever, but that's the dawning of the armor and putting the corsets on, you know, <laughs> that is equated with the dawning of the armor. Let me just make sure written in 1712 satire, you know, that's written in rhyming iambic pentameter and heroic couplets, couplets, 
that rhyme. This is the, the epic form. Couplets that rhyme, but also couplets that the sort of thought, the idea is concluded inside the two lines. Almost like an in-stopped line, but it's two lines and it's a, it's called encapsulated. <clears throat> It's kind of rough on women. What did women do then? But we have to give them a pass, man, because look, women couldn't, there was no voting, you know, not women couldn't vote. I mean, some of the gentry were able to vote for parliament at that time, not the women. Um, women couldn't go to the university. Not yet. We were on the edge of it. We were on the edge of it. But women in that time, their, their only station in life was to have children, to, to marry, and to marry as well as they possibly can and then to have children and maintain the household. But aristocratical women, they didn't maintain any household. They had people to do that, right? Especially noble women and definitely royal women, right? So, so what did the people at the court do all day? They got dressed, put their makeup on, went out and socialized, played cards. They played cards, man. So in the <laughs> Rape of the Lock, the battle scene, the armor makeup and the, the battle scene is the cards. They're playing cards. <laughs> and, and that has the kings and the queens and, and the, the treachery and the triumph and all of that. And during one of these card games is when the baron, and we'll read this, when the baron... Okay. All right. Oh, so about women. Um, in the end, okay, so he's pretty down on women, but he's really not. In, in the end, he has, uh, <clears throat> Belinda has a speech, and she comes out, and I think it's fabulous. I think she's saying, listen, you, you charge me of van with vanity. What else is there for me to do? I have to marry above my station. It's all, my, all the power that I have. And me, I have these beautiful red, and think of, you know, an Irish woman with the red hair, you know, like Wendy's, you know, this stupid fast food place, you know, her hair. Think of, think of uh, real, true, red, beautiful hair curled into locks. And that's what was stolen, one of those locks. Okay. Uh, I don't want to tell you about this one part yet. But then the, in the end, there's uh, all these heroic epics really end with like an apotheosis. The hero becomes a god. Evolated, ever, you know. In this case, uh, <clears throat> Belinda's lock of hair kind of ascends into the sky and becomes a star, which is pretty funny. <laughs> okay, here we go. I'm on page 509, and we're going to start on line 35. guys doing over there? Here! <laughs> so you'll instantly realize, recognize the language. It's, it's high, lofty, over-the-top, overbearing, ostentatious, bombastic, everything you want to say. Hear and believe thy own importance, no, nor bound thy narrow views to things below. Some secret truths from learned pride concealed to maids alone and children. There are some secret things that are so important that pr prideful, you know, vain people, you can't tell them that. Only told to maids. A maid is a good, you know, young woman. And, uh, and children. Only revealed to them. And here's what one of them is. What thou no credit doubting wits may give, the fair and innocent shall believe. Know then, unnumbered spirits round thee fly. Around you fly spirits, infinite in number, all around you. The light militia of the lower sky. What is a militia but an army? So here we have the gods. Remember these epics, it starts with the gods having a, I mean, of course, Milton tries to describe not just the universe, but like God and Satan and the battle. 
But here we have the militia, like Milton, but it's not God's. They are, and I'll tell you, these, though unseen, are ever on the wing. Hang o'er the box and hover around the ring. Think what an equipage thou hast in air, and view with scorn two pages and a chair. As now your own, our beings were of old. And once enclosed in woman's beauteous mold, thence by soft transition we repair from earthly vehicles to these of air. He says, women, and now he doesn't go on to the men, but women, when they die, and I'm going to, I'll give it to you, uh, I'll cheat and tell you. I'm going to read it still, but I'll cheat and tell you. So when women die, they, the hot-tempered ones, the mean ones, the shrews, they become salamanders. Okay? The ones that are prudes, you know, unwilling, uh, just prude, uninteresting, boring, they become gnomes. Okay? And the ones that are... Um, too promiscuous or a pushover, not sexually, but even just like, you know, um, ineffectual, weak, like, you know, um, not willing to take a stand and be strong. They become nymphs. And then there's the sylphs, S-Y-L-P-H-S. And they are the coquettes. They are the, they are the attractive, beautiful women who are also morally, in their eyes, pure, chaste, virginal. We talked about all of that before and how important that was for women then. Um, they become sylphs. The sylphs, the sylphs fly all around. And I believe the nymphs fly too. But they're, they are, think of them like fairies. And this actually comes from an old like Catholic, uh, Catholic uh, mythology type of thing. I don't think anybody ever really took it seriously, but it comes from a strange version of, of of Catholicism. But anyway, so that's that. And he says this. <clears throat> that's what he said. Women from this world, from this beauteous, I hate that word, beauteous, from this beauteous mold, thence from a soft transition we repair from earthly vehicles to these of air. Fairies, sprites. Think not when women's transient breath is fled that all her vanities at once are dead. So that's an example of maybe a little misogynistic uh, language. Succeeding vanities still she regards, and though she plays no more or looks the cards, card game, her joy <clears throat> in gilded chariots when alive and love of umber after death survives. This is a card game, umber. For when the fair in all their pride, notice the words, vain, pride. He's really setting it up. This, If you were writing about this, I would expect that you would write about diction. Uh, yep, vanity, um, pride, gilded, transient breath, these kind of things. Fair, okay. Uh, to the... When, for when the fair in all their pride expire, beautiful people, when their pride expires, they die. To their first elements, their souls retire. The sprites of fiery turgamentants in flame. So these are the, the fire, hate, you know, mean, hateful ones. Mount up and take a salamander's name. Lizard-like animal in antiquity to believe to live in fire. They believed that the salamander was impervious to fire. So that means the women who were, have a fiery tongue, you might say, or whatever, they become salamanders. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> soft yielding minds to water glide away and sip with nymphs their eternal tay. And graver prude shrink sinks down to a gnome in search of mischief still on earth to roam. The light coquettes in sylphs aloft 
repair and sport and flutter in fields of air. <laughs> so these are all the mythical creatures revolving around us all the time. No further yet. Whoever fair and chaste rejects mankind is by some sylph embraced. Uh, every person, every woman who is, well, rejects mankind, that's man, men, it, it rejects the advancements of men, someone who is virginal and chaste before marriage. These people are bound to become sylphs themselves, and therefore their guardian angels, so to speak, will be sylphs. Yeah. Okay. Um, for spirits freed from mortal laws with ease, assume what sexes what and what shapes they please. What guards the purity of melting maids? He's asking a question. What is it? What guards the purity of melting maids? What, when is a maid melt? Oh, gosh. Oh, you're so handsome. God. Melting. What guards the purity of melting maids, of in courtly balls and midnight masquerades, safe from the treacherous friend, the darting spark, the glance by day, the whisper in the dark? When kind occasion prompts their warm desires, when music softens and when dancing fires. I want to tell you this really quickly, super quickly. When the, when the, uh, the waltz, when the waltz came out, meaning when it was invented, I don't know if you know the waltz, but it's a, it's a, it's a three by three, one, two, 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 three. So, but you spin <laughs> and uh, it's really a fun dance. It's easy to do. It's kind of like Texas two-stepping, but you stand up on your tiptoes for the, for the two and three count. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, right? <laughs> it was banned at a lot of courts because people would just waltz all night. And they said that it, it, it evoked a lust among people, and there was all kinds of adultery and stuff going on. And then they finally had to reinstate it. <clears throat> That's the waltz anyway. So this is the when dancing fires, tis but their sylph, the wise celestials know, though honor is the word with men below. Okay, so... What protects these women from having sex? I mean, there's no, there are no dummies. Women have the same desires as anybody else, right? But what protects them? How can they resist mankind all this way? Well, the honor, I mean, men say, and women, they would say, well, it's honor, my honor. It is my honor. But what Alexander Pope is saying is, no, it's a sylph or multiple sylphs. You have these spirits flying around you. Okay, well, we'll see what he means. Some nymphs there are too conscious of their face for life predestined to the gnome's embrace. <laughs> Ouch. <sighs> so the word nymph, let's talk about that. You can look at uh, footnote five here and after a fanciful name for a young woman to be distinguished from the nymphs, water spirits. Yeah, so that, right, right. The water spirits, that's a whole other thing. But in this case forward, it's like young, fun, cute young women, type thing, the nymphs. You know. Okay. But some nymphs, there are too conscious of their face for life predestined to the gnomes embrace. These swell their prospects and exalt their pride when offers are disdained and love denied. Then gay ideas crowd the vacant brain while peers and dukes and all their sweeping train and garters, stars, and coronets appear. And in, this, and in soft sounds, your grace salutes the ear. 
it's really pretty magnificent. I mean, it's kind of uh, tedious, but I think with the right kind of inflection and all that, and it's not actually iambic pentameter perfectly the whole time. It kind of varies it a little bit so that it doesn't become sing-songy and kind of tedious, like I said. Uh, these, <clears throat> and in soft sounds, your grace salutes their ear. Tis these that early taint the female soul, instruct the eyes of young coquettes to roll. T I mean, I mean, that's pretty cool. This is like the, the uh, it's a Greek myth. This is Narcissus, he stared and he fell in love with his own image. And, uh, you know, I think he's kind of, at this point in the, in the epic, he's trying to kind of uh, charge women with being sort of narcissistic, you know, kind of just incredibly self-absorbed, vain is another word. And, uh, but we talked about that just a minute ago. What else, you know? Um, but this is the, the, some nymphs are too conscious of their face. This is like... Um, the ones, you ever known somebody who, okay, this is it. We used to call them when I was a kid, we call them posers. What it means is just somebody who's flat out fake. They're always trying too hard, putting on airs, you know. I'm, and I, I'm going to give these people a, a wide berth, but, but, um, but like whatever the new haircut is, they got to go get the same thing and, you know, all that. Um, this is, I think, what he's talking about. Some women, he's saying, some nymphs are too up with the new styles. They're not trendsetters, they're trend followers. They are too about themselves, too perfect, you know what I mean? And, and they're the ones that are destined to be gnomes, he says. Ouch. But also, they're the ones that make the, the others who are destined to be sylphs roll their eyes so violently like that, you know? And so basically what he's trying to say is their society had become trite. Right? It had become false. It had been, it become self-absorbed. What's another word for it? Fake. Keeping up with the Kardashians. I guess I, I guess I don't need to say anymore, you know? Okay. All right. So let's go to page 512. I'm at uh, line 20. Now, he's describing, he is describing um, Beatrice, uh, Belinda. I don't know why I call her Beatrice. Belinda. She sleeps well into the day because she does nothing else. She doesn't have a, any other vocation. Um, okay, good, good, good. Now we're on Canto 2. And in Canto 2, he really takes... Uh, Belinda's triviality to a to its highest level. She is one who is kind of I wouldn't call her narcissistic, but I would call her very caught up on her own looks. Um, and then enters the Baron, and the Baron is the man who will eventually take her lock of hair. This is true. This really happened in real life. A Baron's a high kind of rank, right? This nymph, line nineteen. This nymph, to the destruction of mankind. When he, say, when he says mankind, he really means men. Like men, the kind of people who are men. This nymph, to the destruction of mankind, nourished two locks which gracefully hung behind in equal curls and well conspired to deck with shining ringlets her smooth ivory. So she had these two beautiful locks of hair, right? Love. Now this is this, I'm sorry, this cracks me up. Love. The, the, it was probably Cupid, you know, the God, like love, the God of love in these labyrinths, his slaves detains. <laughs> so the God of love detains his slaves inside her locks. Now that's taking it to a, a level, isn't it? Okay. And mighty hearts are held in slender chains. So, you know, these, it's like the servitude and slavery. These are all words of servitude and slavery. Slender chains would be the locks of hair. You can see little tiny hearts 
tied up with hair. Oh, right. Okay. With Harry, with Harry Springer's, with birds betray, slight lines of hair surprise the finny prey. Fair tresses, man's imperial race ensnare, and beauty draws us with a single hair. So these are her locks. And, and the language to me is kind of like Milton, you know, evoking gods and goddesses, uh, taking it to the ultimate level of, of eternal importance, you know. <laughs> like, okay, and then enters the baron. The adventurous baron, the bright locks admire. He saw, he wished, and to the prize aspired. Resolved to win, he meditates the way. By force to ravish or by fraud betray. For when success a lover toils attends, few ask if fraud or force attain his ends. I got a problem with that, you know, I really do. And I think he's saying it in an ironic voice. I don't think he really means, hey, man. But, uh, you know, we talked about earlier, like, Gre the, the movie Grease. He says, there's that wonderful song that I love, the song, Tell Me More, Tell Me More, Did She Put Up a Fight? Uh-huh, 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 uh-huh. Okay, well, that's, that's crappy, right? That's horrible. But here's, he says it in another way. He says, when success a lover's toil finds or attends, Few ask if fraud or force attended his ends. I don't think, like in a moral sense, I don't like that. But I could point out the alliteration. Maybe you could do something with that. Okay. Now I'm going to go to page, what time, how much time do we have? Ah, we're all right. I'm going to go to page um, 517 and line 125. Any thoughts up to this point? I wish we could go through every single... Okay, and before that is the, the card game. She's at the card game. Line 125, but... Uh, are we, we're in Canto 3 now, I believe. Yeah, Canto 3. This is... Um, <clears throat> cutting of a lock is alluding to kind of a form of castration. Back in this time period, if you were betrothed to someone, if you were going to marry them, if you had promised yourself to them, whatever, you would cut off a lock of your hair and give it to them. So <clears throat> it's almost a promise of, how do you say it? Almost a promise of um, giving up your virginity to the person. So it's almost, in a sense, in a way, in a certain way, it's like rape, a rape to take it by force, you know? And I'll make a big deal out of this of the steel here in a minute. Okay. Which is a pun, but also it really means steel. Ready? But when to mischief mortals bend their will, how soon they find fit instruments of ill. Just then, Clarissa drew with tempering grace a two-edged weapon from her shining case. So ladies in romances assist their knight. Pre present the spear and arm him for the fight. He takes the gift with reverence and extends the little engine on his finger ends. Just behind, this just behind Belinda's neck is spread as o'er the fragrant steams she bends her head swift to the lock i love this part this cracks me up swift to the lock a thousand sprites retire re repair and thousand wings by turns blow back the hair so so the the it's they're called sprites here but it's like the little uh, the little creatures the sylphs and whatnot they see the hair about to be cut and so a thousand of them go and flap their wings and blow the hair and blow the hair out from the, you know, scissors. Okay. A thousand wings. 
Um, and thrice they twitched the diamond in her ear. Oh, by the way, she has a sylph that, that guards her ring, her earrings, her locks, her every part of her, she has a sylph that guards it. Okay. Thrice she looked back, and thrice the foe drew, ne drew near. Right? Um, just in that instant, anxious Ariel sought the close, the close recess of the virgin's thought. Now, this is Ariel. This is her overall sylph that is her, her uh, kind of guardian angel. Just in that instant, ancient, anxious Ariel sought the close recesses of the virgin's thought. So Ariel got into her brain, into her mind, as on the nosegay in her breast reclined. He watched the ideas rising in her mind. Sudden he viewed, in spite of all her art, an earthly lover lurking at her heart. Amazed, confused, he found his power expired, resigned to fate, and with a sigh, he retired. So he knew at that point, this, this self. It's like, it's like her guardian angel in her head, <clears throat> um, it's Ariel. I don't know why he's calling it he, but anyway, uh, knew that couldn't do it, couldn't change her. And so he slinks away. And then just so you know, later on, uh, another, a, a, a gnome comes and takes his place and uh, really screws her up. <laughs> but anyway, so um, the peer now stands, the glittering thorax wide, to close the lock now joins it to divide. To enclose the lock now joins it to divide. Even then, before the fatal engine closed, a wretched sylph too fondly interposed. Fate urged the shears to cut the sylph in twain. So, so here he's gonna cut the lock and uh, a sylph I mean, the imagery is amazing. This, this sylph oh, throws herself on the, on the lock just as he's cutting it. And he cuts the sylph in two. And so, and, but then it says, but airy substance soon, soon unites again. So the sylph is a, it's a fairy. You can't hurt it. Cut it in two. Oh, you know. The meeting points, the sacred hair to sever from the fair head forever. And forever. <laughs> the meeting points, they meet and sever the hair from the head forever and forever. Okay, now I'm gonna put my tool up here. Now, <laughs> I don't know if you guys are having fun, but I am. Then flashed the living lightning from her eyes, and screams of horror rend the affrighted skies. Not louder shrieks to pitying heaven are cast when husbands or when lapdogs breathe their last, <laughs> or when rich china vessels fallen from high in glittering dust and painted fragments lie. So she stands up. Rah! You know, just angry. She's pissed off. Let and he says, "This is the uh, this is the Baron." Let wreaths of triumph now my temples twine. The glorious prize is mine. And he holds up the. While fish and streams or birds delight the air, or in a coach a six and six the British fair, as long as Atlantis shall be red or the small pillow grace a lady's head while visits shall be paid on solemn days when numerous wax lights in bright order blaze while nymphs take treats or assassinations give so long my honor name and praise shall live what time would spare from steel receives its date okay this is, I mean, you know, it's a, it's a mock epic, right? You remember the swords, take, 
take Umber through it. Take my sword. Remember all that from Beowulf? Like, this is the family sword, and it is a terror. You know, it's steel, right? So we go through periods of civilization. We go from, you know, uh, stone, bronze, steel. Now we're in the steel age. Stone is like forever. It's the pyramids. It's the etching on a tombstone, right? So here we see the, the uh, clash between the old ways and the new ways, the ways of steel and the ways of stone. The, this etiquette, this overly uh, priggish, precise way of living, um, that's the old ways. The new way is to... Okay. <clears throat> Not that I agree with that. Okay. What time would spare from steel receives its date and and keep in mind just change one letter and it's to steal the lock <clears throat> to rape the lock from her and moments like men submit to fate steel could the labor of gods destroy and strike to dust the imperial towers of troy steel could the works of mortal pride confound and hew triumphal arches to the ground what wonder then fair nymph Thy hair should feel the conquering force of unresisted steel. Right? So he, 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 he's mocking the gods in this way. And in the same way, he's kind of poking fun at this, you know, incredible, uh, he's very Catholic, by the way, but he's kind of poking fun at uh, uh, Milton in that way. Oh, you think you can write a new portion of the Bible, basically? Okay, so here we have this fight in the end it's the last battle scene and it's hilarious because it's not i mean they don't use weapons like they're blowing snuff at each <laughs> sorry they're blowing snuff on each other and stuff i mean you think how would aristocrats have a battle how would the court have a battle and this is it um see how much we have time for okay uh, let me see where to start here <clears throat> Oh, so the, the whole thing is she wants Belinda. She wants her lock back. She wants it back. Um, and he's not going to give it to her. Let's start on Canto 5, and I'm going to read it kind of fast, but this is her speech. Ready? We're going to go on um, line 9. Say, say, why are beauties praised and honored most? The wise man's passion and the vain man's toast. Why decked with all that land and sea afford? Why angels called and an angel like adored? Why saying you? These are all the things that women are. She's saying, and all of this, and you charge me with vanity. Shame on you. And you charge me with vanity enough to cut my lock. Shame on you. Why round our coaches crowd with white gloved bows suitors? Why bows the side box from the innermost inmost rows? How vain are all these glories, all your pains, men, your bow, you know. Um, unless good sense preserve what beauty gains, that men may say when we, the front box grace, behold the first in virtue as in face. Oh, if to dance all night and dress all day charmed, the smallpox or chased old age away. Who would not scorn what housewife's cares produce? Or who would learn one earthly thing of use? To patch, nay, ogle might become a saint. Nor could it sure be such a sin to paint. She's, she's defending women. And if you really look at what she's saying, she's got a great point. You know, this is why I think uh, Pope was not being misogynistic because he wrote this too, you know, <clears throat> and this is kind of the, the last. But since, alas, frail beauty must decay, curled or uncurled, since locks will turn gray, since painted or not painted, all shall fade. And she who scorns a man must die a maid. What then remains but well our power to use and keep good humor still whatever we lose? And trust me, dear, good humor can prevail when airs and flights and screams and scolding fail. 
Beauty's in vain, their pretty eyes may roll. You may roll your eyes all you want. Charms strike the sight, but merit wins the soul. And then, and then poor thing. So spoke the dame, but no applause ensued. <laughs> okay. Belinda frowned, and they all called her prude. <laughs> and then she says, I don't know who says, Virago, so, uh, I think, I don't know who said, it's hard to tell who says it, but two arms, <laughs> there starts the war, two arms, right? And, uh, and then, oh my gosh, you guys, remember the bodkin, bear bodkin? Well, on line 55, uh, umbral, these are the little, gold, these are the little fairies and stuff, um, they're in the fight, popped on the bodkins, propped, on the bodkin spears, the sprites survey the growing combat and assist the fray. So the little sprites, they have bodkin spears. <laughs> they're, they're, they're propped up on those the, the bodkin spears. And it says, <clears throat> um, I'm on line 70, just for arbitrary, I'll just go, I'm on line 75. C. Fierce Belinda on the barren flies with more than usual lightning in her eyes. Now feared the chief, the unequal fight to try, who sought no more than on his foe to die. But this lord, this bold lord with many strength in, endued, with one finger and a thumb subdued, just where the breath of life his nostrils drew, a charge of... <laughs> A charge of snuff, the wily virgin threw. So she took a took snuff and threw it in his face. <laughs> the gnomes direct to every atom just the pungent grains of titillating dust. Sudden, with starting tears of each eye or flows, and the high dome reechoes of his nose. So he's he's sneezing and he's he he can't see and he's sneezing. And she says, meet thy fate. <laughs> Incense Belinda cried and drew a deadly bodkin <laughs> from her side. <laughs> meet thy fate. The same, his ancient personage to the deck. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to keep that. I'm going to go. And then, uh, boast not my fall, he says, insulting foe. <laughs> See the language, how high it is. And uh, thou by some other shalt be lain low, nor think to die, dejects my lofty mind. All that I dread is leaving you behind. Rather than so, ah, let me still survive and burn in Cupid's flames, but burn alive. <laughs> He's saying, I'd rather, I'd, I'd rather burn in the flames of desire and burn alive, you know. And she says, restore the lock. <laughs> restore the lock, the vaulted roofs rebound. Not fierce Othello in such loud a strain, in so loud a strain, roared for the handkerchief that caused his pain. You'd have to know Othello. But see how oft ambitious arms are crossed and chiefs contend till the prize is lost. The lock obtained by guilt and kept with pain in every place is sought, but sought in vain. With such a prize, no mortal must be blessed. So heaven decrees with heaven who can contest. So, and then this is the end. Um, <clears throat> Some thought it mounted to the lunar sphere. Since all those lost on earth are treasured there, their heroes' wits are kept in ponderous bases and snow snuff boxes and tw okay so so i'm gonna go down and basically uh then cease bright nymph to mourn thy ravished hair which adds new glory to the shining sphere not all the tresses that fair head can boast shall draw such envy as the lock you lost for after the murder after the murders of your eye when after millions slain yourself shall die, when those fair suns shall set 
as set they must, meaning after all you guys are all gone in the end, and all those tresses shall let be laid in dust, this lock the muse shall concentrate to consecrate to fame and midst the stars describe inscribe Belinda's name. 